There we are. Good old familiar life on Earth. It doesn't feel familiar anymore, though. The older we get, it doesn't feel like things are going very well at all. As life goes on, it's, it seems like our whole planet, our lives here, are just getting worse. You know, as life keeps going on, we have to ask the question, is it going to get any better? Is there hope on the horizon? Is the hope that we have good enough for our city and our lives here now, for our families? We as the church have to ask the question, is following Jesus what we thought? Uh, actually, a better question to ask is, are we doing it right? Are we following Jesus the way that he wants to lead us, the way that he intends for us to follow him? Do we really understand the message that we have for the world, the story that we have been given? And are we sharing it correctly? You see, we as people use stories to interpret and give meaning to our experiences. So do we have the story right? Do we know the true story of God? A raise of hands for families who have kids on fall break at the moment. Okay, like three of you. So the rest of you are joining us online in your pajamas because <laughs> you're ready for school to start back up, right? Hey, I want to say thank you for those of you who are joining us online. I know that you're trying to figure out how to make these decisions on a week-in and week-out basis on when and how soon the right time for you to rejoin gatherings in person are. I know some of you are being incredibly cautious, and I, I just want to invite you to continue to make sure that you don't grieve your conscience trying to make this decision. That yes, God's desires that his people would meet together, that we would not neglect to do so. At the same time, God does not want us, while we are still in relationships, keeping in touch with, you, with each other, to purposefully put ourselves at risk where we're grieving our conscience and we're denying what we believe God is leading us to do. God chose faith in every single person's life as the means for them to discover what he's doing. And here's what I mean by that. Our trusting him in the moment doesn't mean that we get the right decision right each time. But that as best as our faith is able to believe in him, to trust in him, we are in a clear conscience doing what we believe he's leading us to do. So I hope you at home understand that. And for those of you joining us here on, uh, in, in person as well, understand that. These are tricky times for each individual to get the decision right. So be gracious, be merciful as our Heavenly Father is merciful in us, that people in good measure trying to do things out of obedience are trying to figure out what to do. Uh, my name is Drew Hildenbrand. I'm the, the pastor here at Church of Maine. For those of you who are new, I, I would love to get a chance to meet you at the end of the service today. Today we're going to kind of continue this series, The True Story of God. What I want to kind of lay before you is this text today. Uh, this text, this is, this is really the only scripture you need to be responsible for today. It's Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. This true story of God thing that we've been walking through has a design. I think you've probably noticed that. And the design is to tell a story. And, and what I want you guys to maybe recognize week in and week out is, is this. Your beliefs about life and what it's meant to be doing in this moment that you're in, it's driving more than you realize. What your mommy and daddy taught you as a kid, whether or not you realize it, you are so deeply anchored in it that even if it's untrue, you are going to never move from it unless God moves you. And what I want this series to do is to open us up to actually know God's story, the story he's given us in Scripture. And a lot of times when we think this through, we think story, we think made up. We think fiction. That's not true. If I meet somebody for the first time, I ask them, tell me about yourself. I'm asking them to tell me a story. Not, hey, I'm six foot one, um, I'm only slightly balding, and, um, you know, that wasn't funny. <laughs> Shame on all of you. You're in sin. Uh, this series is meant to tell us what's going on. What's really going on? What's, what's been going on in the past? What's going on now? Some of you right now in this season of life that you're in, whatever season it is, and I want to use that word intentionally because at the end of the message, I'm going to bring that word back up. Whatever season you're in, whatever moment of life you, you think you're finding yourself in right now, everything that you've believed is true is what you are using and leaning on and relying on right now to get you through this, to get you forward, to get you into where you hope to be. You are leaning heavily on the story you believe to make sense of, and to make decisions for the life now and the life going forward. Does everybody, do you see that? It is, vi church at Maine, look at me. It is vitally important that you know the story that God has given us. Because if you know what he knows, 
and you're going to be able to lead your life the way that he's calling you to, and it won't be so hard. You're going to know in the moment how he's leading you, what to believe. You're going to know the moments that are confusing and how to proceed with caution or to proceed with care or to proceed with a blazing trail, no fear, no anxiety, because you're going to know exactly what it is your Heavenly Father has given you boundaries for and a clear line to move forward. Has everybody got that? You've got to know the story. Jesus knew the story. So I want to invite you uh, in your Bibles, Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. I'm going to read that text. I'm going to walk you through a sort of recap this morning, but with a clear design. This isn't a week off for those of you who are in the middle of fall break. Not a week off. But we're going to recap some of these things because I think if you get a chance to relook at some of these things we've talked about in recent weeks, I want to show you what you can do with it internally, in your relationships, in your job, your marriage, your money. I want to show you how to wake up in the morning and know that when I'm at work and I encounter this moment, I can think of these things in the context of what I'm learning in our church gatherings as a way of talking to somebody who doesn't love God, doesn't even like Him really. They barely like me. But maybe if I can listen to it in this way, I can share with them something that will hopefully lift their chin and help them see that their Heavenly Father, the Creator of the universe, does love them. And has chosen to demonstrate that love through his son, Jesus Christ. So if you have a Bible, Mark chapter 1. I'm going to read this text and then I'll walk you through why. Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 14. Now after John the Baptist, or the baptizer, was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee. He was proclaiming the gospel of God. And he's saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe in the good news. Information, not advice. A lot of times when we hear gospel, we think um, a lot of religious advice. Behave better, do this, attend this thing. That's not what I'm saying. The gospel is information. Something's happened in history. And if you know what's happened in history, think story. You're going to live your life in light of it. Women in the room. On November 3rd, you're going to be able to participate in something that 200 years ago you wouldn't have been allowed to do on this continent. Why? Because something happened in history. Yes? Something happened in history, and because something happened in history, now we're acting in light of the story. Right? So if you understand that Jesus comes onto the scene in this moment, and he's trying to tell people who are living a story, hey, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand Believe in the story, the good news, the information. Something's happened. And that news changes everything. Jesus was compelled to tell people the story because he knew that those people that he was talking to were train wrecking the story. They were making all kinds of decisions. And most of you know our churches are so fragmented in America. I was talking with somebody this week about the lack of unity in churches. Just think about this for a second. There are so many churches in Brownsburg. I heard so many people in my life tell me that planting a church in Brownsburg seems arrogant at best. Why? Because there's already so many. What, what's the point of planting another one? And, and they have to ask the question, what would it take for all of these churches to worship together in the same doctrine, the same truth, the same gospel, the same glory, and understand the same Jesus? What would it take? What's in the way of that? We are. We are in the way. Because we are so deeply rooted in certain things, all of us are, that we're unwilling to relinquish. And Jesus comes to set the story straight. Because the story that Jesus came to proclaim and give us is the story he wants all of us to live in light of every single day. So in these recent weeks, we've walked through the story, right? We started with week one and we looked at creation. And then we went from creation to what? We went to the fall. This horrible moment in Genesis 3 where we see, and I don't know if you guys approach it the same way, but early in my life I read, I read Adam and Eve and the serpent, you know, and I was just kind of like, oh, there's a tree, there's some fruit, I pictured an apple, and then I saw my iPhone and I thought, oh, does this mean it's satanic because there's an apple, there's a chunk, but I'm, you know, all the things, right? And, and it's not, but I mean, it can be depending on how you use it, but uh, it's, uh, it, it's just an amoral device. It's like a brick, it's a dollar, you do with it what you will. But the fall later in my reading started to actually weigh on me emotionally. You ever read a story or watched a movie where the, the hero like dies? How many of you are familiar with the Avengers? Uh, I'm, I'm totally, if, if, I don't care about movies enough, so I'm going to spoil everything. And, just, and I'm not even going to apologize for it. Avengers, hands in the air. 
of interest. Okay, cool. So, so you know that when, all of you online, Tony Stark dies. Okay? Not even apologizing. If you haven't seen it, I just saved you so much time. Um, <laughs> Iron Man dies. So anyway, Tony Stark passes away. Some of you are crying. That's unfortunate. Um, when Tony Stark dies, the reason that he dies is because he's not immortal, right? But when you're watching the story, you wish that he was, aren't you? Aren't you, as you're watching the story, you're deeply grieved because all of a sudden the story can't end the way that you wanted. You wanted him at the end, didn't you? Right. And when you read Genesis, some of you stop it, crying, stop, knock it off. This is church. When this story happened in Genesis 3, you should actually react the exact same way. Because now what was created isn't. And what was so perfect isn't. And what could have been camped now. It seems everything has changed. And you need to read Genesis 3. And when you see someone in your life sin, your first reaction should not be condemning and antagonistic. It should be grief. Gosh, it shouldn't be that way. But there's hope. Something happened, good news. Something happened in history. And when that event happened, and it did, good news. That even though everything, and this image, this image points to this, this reality that life seems to just have this unwavering downward effect. But God, in his mercy, gives Jesus. And Jesus comes not only to tell good news, but to be good news. And then we have the final component, if you will, of this series, which is new creation. That from the beginning of time, if you were here in week one, we walked through this, from the beginning of time, God has had a clear intention. He told Adam and Eve to, to be fruitful and multiply and to reign and rule over what he had created and make it beautiful and fill the earth with it. Fill the earth with it. And what I want you guys to see is that God is pointing, he's still getting us there. The story is still headed that way. Now, in recent weeks, we had some, some major moments. Um, I, I'm not sure if you guys know this or not, but I'm not a, I'm not a, um, I'm not a chef. I made chili last night. Um, it was really good. So my breath is really bad this morning. There's a reason we don't share the microphones, and it's not for sanitary reasons. This, this thing's going to stink today. That's just, and I even, I even brush my teeth. It doesn't. Chili's chili. So week one, we talked about this story, and what I wanted you guys to understand in week one is this. How many of you guys remember this, this image? Raise your hands. Active church participation. For those of you who weren't here week one, I talked about this idea that all of us have a belief blender. And what we do is in our lives, we kind of go through and we're born in America, so capitalism is good and America's good. We, you know, we, we stand for the pledge and we do those things, right? And, and, and America is, is for the pursuit of happiness and I should be happy and I've got a chance to be happy. And so we kind of cram that in there. And for the, a lot of you, you're born in the Midwest maybe, and so you've got these blue collar roots. So the harder I work, the more I earn, right? And you just kind of jam that in there. And then somebody comes along later and they tell you, hey, Jesus loves you. And you're like, okay, I got room for that. Jesus loves me. You kind of cram, cram that in there. And then what do you do? You, you put this on, you go, and then you got your, your smoothie that you live on. And it's a cocktail of all of the things you believe. You believe that, well, America wants me to be happy and the law is here for me to be happy. And God loves me, so he must want me to be happy. And so I'm just going to pray to him and go to the church thing and be happy. And then what happens when somebody you love dies? or something goes wrong in your life, all of a sudden you look up and you're confused. Why? Because you believed a toxic blending of truth. That God exists to serve you, only you, as you. And that actually makes you the God, not Him. That makes you the King. He serves you. He does what you want, when you want, how you want. And He is here to exist only as your lucky rabbit's foot in life. And then when something doesn't go the way you think that it should, you walk away from the church, you walk away from your Christian relationships, you don't read your scriptures, you don't pray. Why? Because God isn't real. He didn't come through for you. No, you've been believing lies. And week one story was to help you see that heaven is not the outcome for Christians. New creation is. That heaven is temporary. God is bringing heaven to the new earth. There will be a new heaven and a new earth and there will be a new reality exists for eternity with us building beautiful things, making music, writing songs, 
building cities filled with peace. And the Prince of Peace will walk among us. He's going to be our friend. We're going to be able to hike mountains and see beautiful valleys and rivers. And we're going to be able to see all of these things with zero pollution and zero destruction and zero fear of it ever ending. It will be almost as if creation ends as it should. Week one, we walked through the story that you and I need to dump out our blender. And we need to put in it only that which Jesus has given us. All the other things need to come out. I'm not saying it's wrong to be happy. Jesus isn't saying never be happy. It's not what I'm saying. Your happiness cannot terminate on things that cannot sustain you. Jesus alone, your creator, is the only one who can bring true joy to your life. Everything else will fail you. She will. He will. It will. All of them. God alone cannot. So you either believe in him and you trust in him, or all the other things you believe in and trust in will eventually let you down. Week two, we walked through a little bit more of a series. This was the week most of you did not like. We walked through 76 Bible verses. And, and you all stayed awake, and I'm so proud of you. Most of you. But anyway, it was intense because we walked through that from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, God, Jesus, always keep their promises. If you are a worrier, you're someone who's prone to worry, this message should have lifted your chin a little bit. Because you would know by worrying that you haven't had a whole lot of success changing the world through your worrying. Some of you are living a life that you know you shouldn't be living. Because in these promises, there are promises to bless, but there's also promises to judge. That there's a judgment coming. That the end of the story has this intermission, if you will, near the end. And in that intermission, everyone is resurrected and stands before God and has to give an account for their life. And your name is either written in the Lamb's book of life, you are either written in the name, with your name in the Lamb's book of life, that God gives you the name in Revelation 2.17, that you have revealed to you that your name belongs to Jesus by the faith that you had in him. Did you believe him? Did you trust him? Did you believe his gospel? And the way that that would evidence itself out in your life is dependent on what you do with your time. What do you love? Do you love to serve self, feed self, give to self, comfort self, or do you love to do those things for those who have not? Does your heart desire to see our planet made whole and beautiful? Does your, what does your heart want? Because if you have these promises of God showing up in your life, then you would have these promises showing up in your life as evidenced out of your heart. And we talked about covenant, the idea that a covenant is something that two parties enter into promising to do certain things. God promised that he would come to some people and put his heart of flesh in their lives, take out their heart of stone. He would put his spirit inside of them and cause them to walk in his ways, and that those would be people of his new covenant. And so in week two, we walk through these promises to show you that Jesus and God always keep their promises, promises to bless, to give, and also promises to judge. Jesus and God always keep their promises. And the third group of people for this message was well, those of us who we've been let down by people that we care about. We've kind of run out of people we can rely on. Jesus and God always keep their promises. So if you pour through the scriptures and you look for the promises of God in here, that for those who, who love him and trust him, he will do good. That God hears your prayers. Did you know God actually does answer your prayers? Did you know that one day you're going to judge angels, child of God? Did you know that you're going to reign with Jesus? And that reigning is real. Do you know your destiny? Jesus and God always keep their promises. And so if you know that story, if you know that story, then right now while you're here, you can act, think, do, and be according to that story. And so one of the things I want you to do is I want you to look at your life. Are, what story are you reflecting when you are doing the things you're doing? Are you living in this fear and you never pray and you never, you don't, because I'm just going to challenge you. I think your belief blender still needs some work. I think you need to believe the promises of God, the promises that he's given you. 
Repent and believe in the good news of Jesus Christ. Believe, trust in, put your confidence in it. Don't put your confidence in your ability to do a good job. Put your confidence in the ability that God has placed within you to no matter what you're doing, to do it all for the glory of God. That you can do great and immeasurable good in this world, even if the world around you laughs at you. You can bring peace in situations through prayer and your obedience that simply could not come otherwise. God has you as his instrument of choice in the world right now. Jesus and God always keep their promises. The third week, Hosea walked us through an intense conversation on worship. To help us recognize that in the beginning, there are things that God gave us, and, and the reality is that our relationship with him was sacred. Everybody look up at me for a second. I want you to think just for a minute, what in your life is sacred? Just think about it for a second. Some of you, it could be the memory of family members who've gone before you. It's sacred to you. For some of you, it could be an heirloom or something in your home. I'm going to be honest with you, uh, this has kind of become sacred to me. Not just the Word of God, of course it is, but this particular copy. I was in Arizona at a prayer conference a couple of years ago, and uh, a friend of mine had this, the, this copy of, of the Scriptures like this, and, and he was working out of them, and he was highlighting, and I had this other copy, and it, it, it wasn't necessarily like this one or whatever, but he saw how, um, how hungry I was, is what he, he told me later. I was just kind of like, Ah, right, Bible, Bible, Bible. I was just studying it, and I was so hungry for it that when I came home from the conference, this was waiting for me, that he'd bought it while we were out there and had it delivered to my home, along with highlighters and a ruler and, and a whole bunch of things ready for me to get to work on my new copy. And so almost every Sunday I preach from this. It is my favorite copy, and it's very nice, but more importantly, it's the intent with which it was given. It, it's kind of sacred to me. Is everybody, do you, do you know what I'm talking about when I say sacred? So let me ask you, and this is not meant to convict you from my words. This is meant to open up your heart from him. Is your time with him and your relationship with him, would you classify it? Would you classify it as sacred? Guys, we're running out of time here. I mean, we take a breath and this story's over for us. Some of you are getting really old fast. <laughs> I'm not even going to point out who. Some of you seem to be going slower about it, and that's, that's cute. Um, I wouldn't hang out with you much. We wouldn't have much in common. So that, um, what do you want to do with the rest of what you've got? Do you want to devote it to that which is sacred, or do you want to continue to dilly-dally in that which is profane? What do you worship? What does your time say you make much of? What does your thought life say that you make much of? Like the things that are going on in here, what, what do you make the biggest? And I'm, look, this is not meant to beat you up. This is meant to lift you up by showing you what's in you, that God is hopeful and so excited to redeem in you. This is a loving father coming to you saying, Look, child, I've, I've, I've purchased you. Let me show you what is truly good and sacred and let me give it to you. But in order for you to receive it, you'll need to let go of that which is not. And so God comes to you in this moment. Maybe right now in the seat beside you, picture Jesus sitting beside you. And if he were to do a gentle nudge, and I assume that he might, and he gave you a gentle nudge, what's he picturing that you're picturing? What's he saying? Hey, you've been championing this for a while. You want to let it go? Maybe it's a bitter root of unforgiveness towards someone from the past. Maybe it's your ideal of the way you think church or people or marriage or whatever ought to be. And so you've been like hanging on that like crazy. Maybe it's your job. What is it? What is it? You, you know. I'm not going to know. I could sit down with you for hours. I might guess. But right now in this moment where you're sitting, what's God saying to you? The next week, we talked about what's behind me, this idea of image bearers. Many of you maybe are thankful today that I'm not walking around the stage with these. These are mirrors. A couple of weeks ago, I walked around the stage with these, and some of you had to have retinal surgery the following week. It was, it, it was, it was a show, right? It looked a little bit like a Pink Floyd concert, just kind of zoo, 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 lasers everywhere, right? What I walked through with this series, though, in this message, was this idea that in the beginning, God created image bearers that were not him himself. Remember, I picked up the mirror, and I, I shown some people their reflection, and I said, who do you see? And they're like, I see me, right? I was like, okay, so shake your hand. 
oh, I, I can't do that. Why? Because it's not actually you. It's just a reflection of you. It reflects attributes, but it's not you. And in the same way, we were created to reflect God, to be image bearers, made in His likeness, to reflect certain attributes, to demonstrate His wisdom in creation. And then when Eve was tempted by the serpent, we discovered that Adam and Eve had now begun in Genesis 5 to pass down broken images. And, and I don't know if you've ever looked at a broken mirror, and you can come up and look at this later, but it does not matter how much glue, tape, whatever you kind of, fi- you ain't fixing that thing. You can like come to church and do all your metaphoric blah, blah, blah. It, it, it's still broken. The longer you look at it, you'll still see the cracks. And God says, you know what? There's no broken image that can come and be with me forever. None. So he gives us Jesus, the perfect imprint of his very nature, Hebrews 1.3, Colossians 1.13. He is the express image of God himself. He gives us this image and says, this is all I see in you now. I see the perfect image. Now, for the rest of your time, breathing, eating, sleeping, and being, I'm going to give you the power of my Holy Spirit to transform you into the image of my son. Church, the goal that God has for your life is not to get you into the right job, but whatever job you're in, that God is using it to conform you into the image of His Son. Church at Maine, the goal of the true story of God is that you would see what God is doing and get excited about it. The world's going to think you're stupid. Yeah. Don't worry about what the world thinks. It's always thinking lots of things. But care about what God thinks. Because He's the only one who's actually loved you and died for you. The world will only take from you. Steal. The world just wants you to approve of it. It doesn't want you to help it get better. And so God comes to us in our understanding of being an image bearer that he has given us everything we need. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. We've been given everything we need for life and godliness through a knowledge of Jesus Christ. You've, been, you've got everything you need. You are no longer in a position of need. No, Jesus. Get to know him as if he really were sitting beside you. What's he think like? What does he think of Peter? That's everywhere. And it's super fun. You can see him poke fun at people. I mean, think about it. Wouldn't you like to get away with calling somebody Satan once in a while? Jesus did it. I'm not saying you should do that. (laughs) Great. Everybody takes that one lesson away and nothing else. I'm calling everybody Satan because I'm like Jesus. No. Jesus saw people for what they were, but he lifted them what they could be in light of what he was willing to do for them. Last week, we walked through this very unique idea of, how many of you guys almost, almost looked at this? (laughs) That's a trick question, wasn't it? How many of you guys almost, last week, we talked through the idea of kingship. One of the things that came up last week, can, can I tell? I mean, can I? Cool. So folks, this is funny. You know, a lot of times as a pastor or a preacher or teacher, whatever, you, you look for God to, to like move in what you're doing. I got to tell you, this is so funny. So last week after our message, I don't know if you remember this or not, but I walked through certain things at the end. If Jesus is your king, does it make sense for you to, and then I filled in the blank with some fill in the blanks, right? I made up some things. One of the things I talked about was just thinking this through. If Jesus is your king, Does it make sense for you to work in a facility where the primary outcome of your job or the jobs of those around you is to create weapons that ultimately end in killing people? Like maybe nuclear triggers or whatever, right? After the service, somebody walked up to me and said, hey, that's the exact job I have. It took me at least five minutes of listening to him and his wife for me to actually start listening to the rest of their words because I was completely like, wait, what? Out of all the jobs on earth, like seriously, did you, I'm just, you didn't quit this week, right? Okay, go, yeah, okay. <laughs> the goal wasn't to tell people what's right and wrong. The goal was to show you how do you look to Jesus in all these areas of your life, like on your Netflix. Is Jesus king over Netflix in your life? Is Jesus the king over how you f- spend your free time? What about your petty cash? Any of you guys have cash that's just yours, right? It's just in your wallet, it's just yours. Is Jesus the king of that? Like if you're around somebody who's in need, do you reach for it right away or do you pretend that's not there, right? Like I'll go write you a check out of our account, but this, this is mine. How many of you guys have things like that? 
possessions, ideas, even people in your life. Is Jesus the king or is he not? Because whether or not you realize it, we often let Jesus be the king of our morality and the king of maybe some of our religious thoughts and about mm, 2% of our money. And the re- but the reality is Jesus wants to be king and is only going to be king over all of it. Even if you think you're letting Jesus be king of these one or two boxes, he's not, you are. You're picking and choosing when he's king, which means you're king. You're adopting King Jesus' principles to use them and to manipulate them for your outcomes. You are not surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. You're not. And the reason I want you to know that is because all of Scripture points to Jesus being the king that we need. That Jesus is the king. You and I, we talked about this. Judges chapter 21, verse 25, what? In those days there was no king in Israel. So what did everybody do? They did what they thought was right. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound like, I don't know, every day here now? Everybody's just kind of, well, I think, I think, I believe, I say, well, in my eyes, everybody. What does God say? And maybe more importantly, what did Jesus do? So that all the other things we're chasing and all the other things we're making a big deal of, maybe they're not that big of a deal anymore. Do you know what God has done for you? Do you know King Jesus is a better king so kids, those of you who are still in the world of being a student in some sense, sitting down and doing your homework is actually worship. Because God gave you access and a mind and an opportunity to increase your learning in a way that allows you to do more on earth. Your heart decides to what end, but your mind decides the ability. So let me ask you, have you submitted your studies to Jesus? Have you submitted the things you're learning so that God can make much of you in the lives of those that he's stewarding in your care? That he can lift up Jesus in your life while you're educating yourself and others? Do you see that God is using everything, not just some things, for his story? I want to introduce you back to our text. We're going to finish up our time here. After John the Baptist was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee. He was preaching, he was proclaiming this this, this gospel of God, this story of God, this good news about what God has done. He said, the time is fulfilled. I want to leave this here for a second. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Some of you who maybe are Hosea, I'm guessing you, Bill and Karen, Justin, Courtney, I'm guessing some of you guys, Jim, where are you at? Jim Fox, where are you at? Jim, right there. I'm guessing you guys maybe probably already know this, and I'm sure a handful of you others might as well. There's a really neat word in here. It's really neat. It's where I want to spend the rest of our time together today. How many of you guys can see on my wrist a watch? So when Jesus says the time is fulfilled... He didn't mean noon. He didn't mean time on the watch. He didn't mean, hey, it's Wednesday. Seniors eat for free, right? (laughs) To which all of... You guys just woke up. (laughs) That's cute. That was good. I like that. No, in this text, there's a picture. There's a picture of two words. I want to show you what they are. Kronos. The word chronos means time. Time means what I have on my watch. Chronos is this timeline. Like right now, I'm here a few seconds later. Yes, I dance like this all the time. I'm here, right? And I just advanced on the timeline. I moved from that point in history to this point. I know gracefully, but still, I moved from here to here. And that's what chronos is. It's, it's this chronological advance of time. So if I ask you what chronos it is, you would say... Well, it's, um, what time is it? It's 11.05. Oh, I got two hours to preach here. We're good. Okay, so, chronos means this. So when Jesus says the time is fulfilled, this isn't what he said. He used a different word. He used this word. Kairos. And this word is different, folks. I'm going to be honest with you. I have been praying so much this week that either after today or really soon or because of this series that this word
How many of you remember the moment, the time when God came to you? Raise your hand. When you remember the season you were in. The word kairos doesn't mean what you and I normally mean when we think time. The word kairos means moment, opportunity. It could, a kairos moment could last years. A kairos moment could be a blink of an eye, and both of them are time, time, time. Do you remember the time when this happened in your life? And, and it might have been a really hard time or a really amazing time. Like, hey, do you remember when you got married? Kairos. Do you remember when you got your degree? Kairos. Do you remember when they rejected you? Kairos. Do you remember when you realized you weren't going to get the outcome? Kairos. It's a moment, a defining moment, an opportunity for some shift. Church at Maine, Jesus came to people and he said, the opportunity for you to wake up and shift is here. The opportunity for you to finally get it right is now. Not on the watch now. What are you thinking right now? Now. God came in the person of Jesus that said, everything in history, this whole story, the blender thing, the creation and new creation, the fall, Judges, 1 Samuel, David's promise, or God's promise to David in 2 Samuel 7, all the stuff we've covered. All of it centers whew, this one moment in history, this Kairos named Jesus of Nazareth, referred to as the Messiah, the Christ. God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Christ, our cornerstone, our chief priest, Jesus Christ. The moment he came in the flesh, the kairos of all kairos moments, when God stamped his moment in your heart and mine to teach us and to show us that our God is a redeemer, our God is a father, our God is a friend of sinners, our God is a savior and a reconciler, our God is the king of kings, our God is the creator of Amen? And because those things are true and we stand as broken images, we have no hope. You can't fix you. You've, done, you've tried that, right? You watched Oprah, Dr. Phil. Commercials still came. You still turned it off. It didn't work. You can't work this stuff out. You've got to have a heart change from the inside out. What I want to leave you with today is I want you to understand what a kairos really is about. A kairos is a moment where you wake up. There's a lot of these moments in the scriptures. I'll pick one, the, the prodigal son story. Many of you are familiar in Luke 15, there's a story of, of two sons and, and a father. And one of the sons comes to the father, asks for his inheritance, he, and, and there's a lot attached to the story I'm not going to go into right now, but essentially the son runs off and blows all the money, destroys his life. Many of you, maybe your life isn't that dismal. Maybe you're, for you, life's it's going all right. A kairos is a moment where you wake up. And in that story, it says he, he came to his senses. Uh, a guy named Kyle Eidelman wrote a book called Aha, and, and it, these are our aha moments. And, and he actually gave aha uh, a little bit of help by saying these are moments of awakening, honesty, and action. A-H-A. -A. So, Church of Maine, here, here's what I want to finish our time with today. Jesus came with the story being him. He is the promised one in Genesis 3.15 when God says, one day, the seed of the woman, you will strike his heel, but he will crush your head. Serpent, you will have your end. The seed of the woman, later we see as Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the better Moses, the better king, the better David, Jesus comes in the flesh, and instead of coming as a king in a palace, he comes as a baby, humble, meek, and he comes to us. What story do you want to finish with? 
Church at Maine, the point of this series is to get you to get real low for a minute in your spirit. What do you want? What do you want most right now? Because if it's getting the person beside you to get it, you're missing it. If it's getting someone who's not with us today to wake up, you're missing it. At the end of time, God is not going to come to you and say, hey, did you bring everybody else? He's going to say, did you trust me? Did you believe me? Did you believe the story? Because if you did, then guess who else is going to be in that narrative? There are going to be other people. You can't control if they're saved or not. You can't do that. You can't even save yourself. But you can live your life reflecting, do you believe God? Do you trust him? Is your Kairos moment right now where from now on you are not going to be lazy with your life? You're going to live loving and serving other people who very much may not like you. That's okay. If they got to know you, there's not a lot to like, right? <clears throat> oh, now we're having church? But it's the truth. I mean, can we just work that out? You're not that likable. The more time you spend with people, the less time they want with you. Why? Because we're still hugely in need of rescuing in our lives. That's why these messages each week are trying to help point to. So let me give you an example. A couple weeks ago, creation to new creation. How do you tell the story? How do you help somebody have a Kairos moment? I'm golfing with Dwayne Dickerson. Dwayne, if you're watching, I'm telling your secrets. So Dwayne and I are out, and, and Dwayne, uh, we, we participated in the G&I golf outing, and, and, and Dwayne and I are, are we're teeing up, and it's, it, it's mostly Dwayne's show. I mean, let's be honest. Dwayne plays golf. I lose golf balls. That's just what I do. If, I, if, if, the, if the goal is to go that way, and I know mine always hooks that way, I turn this way, it still goes there. It's like there's a magnet somewhere for the ones that I bring. Either way, so Dwayne and I are golfing. Now, here's how you have a uh, true story of God conversation. Now, we didn't do that that day. Dwayne loves the Lord, has given his life to Jesus, okay? And so, as we're golfing together, Dwayne said about, I don't know, Dwayne, what would you say, about 49 times, maybe, uh, throughout the day, this is a beautiful day. And for those of you who were there, it was beautiful. It was an amazing day. But if I were telling somebody the true story of God, I'd say it is, it is amazing, isn't it? Wouldn't you say this is like, if every day was like this, it would be really good, wouldn't it? And Dwayne would probably go, yeah, yeah, every day, that'd be great. It's interesting you'd say that, Dwayne. The God that I serve, Jesus, made this place that way. Did you know that? I've learned in my life, Dwayne, that Jesus actually created us in a way that every day we would see, everything we would touch, everything we would partake in was actually just what you just said all the time. It would never not be that. Isn't that amazing? Wouldn't that be awesome? Did you know that Jesus actually dying on the cross stamped in history that that's actually going to happen? Did you know that, Dwayne? That God is actually going to make everything new again, that new creation, exactly like you wish it was. Bro, there's no more four-wheel drive snow tires in the winter. We don't have to mess with that. I'm, I'm guessing there's snow in the mountains, and for those of you who think that's heavenly, you're weird. But either way, <laughs> you might be right. But what I'm saying is that God's creation will be perfect, that everything's going to be as it should be. Do you see how you can have a conversation with somebody about the true story of God now? Anytime they say, man, this is really good, maybe they're cutting into a steak or whatever, and they're like, oh, this is so good. Man, can you imagine if everything you always tasted, everything you ever ate all the time made you feel that way? Oh, man, I'd be overweight. What if you weren't? What if you could eat like that but still had restraint and you loved it and it was only always good? Did you know, Dwayne, that God wants that for you? And did you know that that's actually the only thing God's been working on since the beginning of time, and he's still making it happen, and that Jesus came in the middle of when it seemed like all hope was lost, and he said, no, 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 the Kairos is here. The Kairos moment when the turn of history has happened. Has the turn of history happened in your heart? Has Jesus come to introduce himself as the king of your life? What story do you believe? 
Do you believe the good story that God loves you? And even though you're a dumpster fire of a human being just like the rest of us, he's going to make you into that perfect image of his son where your life is dominated by peace and joy, patience, kindness. Goodness will fall out of your life. Self-control so you can eat the steak and not too many. Did you know the plan God has for your life, plans to prosper you? That's, that's a picture you need to hold on to. Church at Maine, we can't waste our days. If you know the true story of God, go back and listen to these messages and, and study. When I was an electrician, this, this is what helped me. When I was an electrician, I was running conduit. I was around a lot of guys who were getting divorces and they were horrible with their money. They were making a lot, it, life was hard. They were construction workers working very hard hours and very hard jobs and they were, they were really struggling in moral life. They were. And I remember just listening to sermons that would talk about things like this over and I would listen to them over and almost to where I could reteach what the stories and the points were. And you can plagiarize everything I'm saying because nothing I'm saying is mine. I steal everything. Not literally, but you know what I mean. This isn't me. This is everything that God's given to me through relationships and people. He's just allowed me to remember most of it. None of the things that matter at home, though, you know, like cleaning out the dishwasher, but Hillary, I'll, we'll, we'll deal with that later. So I want you to know the story so that the story follows you into your places of work. And when you're at the barber shop, when you're with your kids and your grandkids, so that when you hear them say something, you'll be able to recall the story and say, did you know? Did you know that as much as you want to be in charge and president one day, that God has actually made a way for a perfect king to rule right now? Did you know that? Did you know as messed up as you are? For some of you, maybe it's counseling opportunities. Randy and Karen, maybe you're, you're talking to some folks and they're recognizing, man, I just can't seem to get it right. I know, but with God's help, you can. You see, because this is what you're experiencing all the time. You're experiencing just broken crack after crack in your life, and God sees that. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, he wants you to know that by learning obedience in Jesus, you too can see these cracks restored only by the name of Jesus Christ. Do you see how you can take the true story and you can talk to people about it and you can help lift their chin and help them finally see God as the hope that he truly is in their life? So Church of Maine, I want to close us with, with this, this question. Close your eyes. We'll do it this way. Bill, Ben, Carolyn, Larry, Alex, Michael, Jacob, Scott, Martha, Bethany, Kathy, Sarah, Cindy, Chris, Karen, Josh, Ed, Rodney, Jimalyn, Randy, Bob, Bruce, Leah. Can I ask you a question? With your eyes closed and your heads down, can I ask you a question? How are you and God doing? In all the relationships in your life, as much as you've striven after and fought for these other things, how are you and God doing? I want to lay before you with your eyes closed. I want to lay before you what Jesus laid before all of these people in Mark 1, verse 15. The kairos is here. The kairos moment to change everything in your life is right here, right now. The kairos is here. So I need you to listen to these two words and then we're going to pray. Jesus told them, repent. Change your whole life mind, and life. Repent and trust. Believe. Trust the good news. Spend your life 
trusting that God and Jesus always keep their promises. Church at Maine, where we're going as a church is dependent upon where you're going in your life and where the Spirit of God is leading you. Not some clever vision statement or things like that. Those are okay things, but it is vitally important that you know where God is leading you. You are the church, not the organization. You are the body of Christ. So how are you and God doing, and are you prepared to totally repent and believe in the good news in a way you've never let it latch onto you before? Church of Maine, let's pray right now. Can I have everyone stand? And here's what I want us to do. I don't know what you're, this might be super uncomfortable for you. I'm just going to ask you to trust me anyway, but I also don't want you to violate. For those of you at home, do the same. I want all of us to pray out loud together at the exact same time. Because when I'm praying by myself, you're listening to my words and you're traveling off into other things and maybe whatever and who knows. And then, and then, but it, don't you wish that all of us just had a single moment access to God the Father? And that's actually what's happening when we do all pray. So let's, let's just make heaven on earth right now by praying as if we're in the throne room together right now. And we have our heavenly Father who has sent his Son to die for us, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful, we are good, we have God's reputation in our life now, we are the clean image. So can we pray like that? Can we go into the holy room and talk to our heavenly Father and ask him to make whatever kairos is needed happen right now? Wake us up. Give us the aha that we individually need and corporately as a body to actually see the gospel of Jesus Christ transform us and the people we're attached to. Do you want that? I know you say yes, but can you pray yes? Look, I don't know what's going on in your life, and maybe some of you, it's you that you've got to let God come after. Or some of you, maybe it's somebody else in your life. This is our moment. The kairos is at hand. Let's pray. Because anytime Jesus' name can be lifted up, kairos is available. Anytime the spirit is available, kairos is available. God wants a legitimate moment in our life where we give up playing fake Christianity and we give up playing normal American life and we be the children of God that he has enabled us to be by the power of his Holy Spirit. You ready to pray with me? Heavenly Father, we love you. All of us out loud together, we are so hopeful, Father, right now that you would just help us. We don't even know what to pray, so Holy Spirit, help. We don't have words necessarily to always pray exactly what we think we need, but right now we do know we need your help. Father, I love you. I'm so sorry for the things that I've made of my week, the distractions that I've let come in my way. I'm so sorry for the silliness I've made of some things. I get distracted a lot, but Father, you are good. All the time, you are good. And you have come to help us know how to follow your son, Jesus. So I'm asking for the Holy Spirit to do just that. Holy Spirit, will you work on me right now to bring to mind a Kairos moment, a type of change that I need to see happen for real. Father, I know for me, it's how I use my time. And time management is so vital and so difficult all the time. Father, I love my wife and my kids so much. I love my family. I love my friends. I've got so little time on earth, and there's so little time available for all these things. Would you help each one of us hold our hands open and fully believe that you are hearing us right now? Here we stand in your throne room. You are seated high and lifted up. And all these beautiful colors we know that are around us in heaven. Father, we stand before you now, and we ask for your help. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, will you help change us? Right now, give us strength to believe the story. Give us strength to leave here living the story. In Jesus' name, we pray together as one holy church, united in your name. Amen. Church of Maine, I am praying. Yes, praise God. Just praise him. Because here's what's true. If Jesus didn't die on the cross, then every single word that we just uttered out would land on the walls and nowhere else. But because Jesus died on the cross and because we have God in our lives, not only did he heard, but he's now acting and doing in light of what you just prayed. 
trust him, believe him, and follow him. Church of Maine, next week, we're going to get to work on the softer side of this series. So if you're done with me beating you up, next week will be a pillower version of this. But until then, you've got work to do. I want to hear some testimonies this week. Love you guys. We'll see you next Sunday.